Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Big Game Indicating Dogs Q&A. These questions are from people who are following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. If you want to find more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, you can go to biggameindicatingdogs.com. If you want to follow us and see loads and loads of photos and posts from people who have trained dogs with the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, you can go to Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram and Facebook. Let's get into the Q&A. <laughs> this first one is a classic. This is from Josh. I, this And this is a trick question. This is a bit of a joke and a bit of a trick. Uh, it's fairly tongue-in-cheek, but um, I am going to give it a serious answer anyway. <laughs> I know Josh. Me and Josh have done a bit of hunting and fishing together. Uh, and Josh is a good hunter in his own right, and a young hunter, but a, a very good hunter in his own right. And uh, <laughs> this is such a clip. His question is, "How do I get as good as you?" Which I literally laughed out loud when I when I read that. And Lawrence gave a, a another tongue in cheek answer. To that and just said um just watch the blueprint and if we're talking about dog training deer dog training um that's really good advice there's nothing really that i can tell you that isn't already in the blueprint and there's actually a lot of stuff in the blueprint i can't tell you um because i spent a year filming it all you know and i was so deep in the game at that point and that at that time making the blueprint and i was uh i'd been writing all my articles for a couple of years and for a few years actually and uh <clears throat> just been doing it full t hunting over indicating dogs full time as a job and uh, I was in the middle of doing all the deer dog boot camps and tons of one on ones and 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 uh, you know like all I was doing was training deer dogs and thinking about training deer dogs full time flat stick and and you can't you can't hold that for too long you can only hold that uh, level of extreme focus on one thing that narrow for so long you know and and that was that was definitely the peak of it of of I'll never make anything on just training a big game indicating dog that will replace the blueprint on a big game indicating dog uh, I'm making the bird dog training stuff now which I'm pumped on. Uh, I, I really want to make a versatile gun dog blueprint. I'm sort of 90, 95% sure I'll do that. Uh, I need to get into the right place to do that again. But the, the and, and it's funny because the more time that goes by after making the blueprint, the more, and, and I've made a lot of stuff since and done a lot of stuff since, the more I look back and, and, and realise... Uh, yeah, what what was happening there, and 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 um, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to think of a way of saying it, but without without saying how good the blueprint actually is, uh, it's freaking good, man. And um, if you're talking about training big game indicating dogs, following the how do you how do I do it like you, the blueprint, um. As far as the question of how do I get as good as you, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna answer that directly because that's pretty dodgy ground. Because um, I, I don't like talking about myself being good, but um, I'll, so I'll answer it as in what is good advice for people who want to be a good dog trainer or a good hunter. Um, kind of stuff that I wish I knew earlier, um, but more just uh, quotes and pieces of wisdom and, and advice that I've heard along the way 
and 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 that have stuck in the back of my mind. And over the test of time, you just I just keep looking back at them and go, that's that's freaking good advice, or that's very true, or I wish I knew that earlier. So, but first of all, <coughs> I mean, just for context, I grew up around, and, and I've got notes here, so this is straight off my notes. First of all, I grew up around dogs and hunting. Uh, I was born around dogs. There were a lot of my dad was a was a bird shooter, shooting ducks and that. Um, he was he was uh, like one of my earliest memories, if not my earliest memory period, is uh, opening morning a duck shooting. And I don't remember going to the pond. I don't remember anything else. I just remember being in the laundry and um, <laughs> this is getting a bit weird actually being because I'm wearing the, the shirt I'm wearing and stuff right now I didn't think about that but uh, being in the laundry and it was opening morning and all my dad's duck shooting friends were around and I remember my dad putting a, a it was either green or brown flannel check shirt on me <clears throat> Um, as as far as he was taking me down to the duck pond, it might not have been opening morning. It might, but it was early and dark. I remember it was dark, and I remember my dad being pissed off as that he was always like short and blunt and harsh. And um, I remember him sort of stand still, hold, put your arm out, and he was try, he was putting a, a shirt on me because whatever I was wearing was too bright. To, to go to be in the Mai Mai, you know, because ducks see, birds see colour and you've got to wear camo and if you're not covered up properly or you're wearing the wrong thing, it can really screw it up. But I remember um, <clears throat> I must have been like three or something. I don't I don't know, maybe my mum could tell me or, or someone could tell me, but... Um, and I remember standing in front of the washing machine and I'm standing, and I remember the washing machine being like at least as tall as me, almost looking up at it. And my dad's check shirt um, getting put on me, and it and it touching the ground. So it, the check shirt was like longer than me. Um, <clears throat> and that's going down to duck shooting, and and just growing up around. Um, Labradors and farm dogs too. We always had. Um, my dad never had a heading dog that I remember, but he always had Hunterways. So I just grew up around dogs and hunting from a really, really young age. And <clears throat> I started hunting when I was seven. I, the first uh, thing I ever shot with a with a gun was a sparrow when I was seven. And um, it's pretty hard to explain how much hunting I did between the age of about seven and and about fifteen or sixteen. Um, I always had access to guns and lots of ammunition, and I had. I'm going to make a video about it actually. After duck shooting, when I've got a bit more time, I'm going to make a YouTube like a big vlog. It'll probably be quite long, and I'll go back to where I grew up and. Um, show the areas and 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 sort of talk more about what I did, but <clears throat> um, again, that's the easiest way I can explain it. Now, it's it, I mean, I'm talking by the time between the ages of seven and fifteen, I had tens of thousands of rounds downrange at animals with dogs next to me. <laughs> that sounds crazy, but that's true. If you if you start right from an air rifle, for those seven, all I did was hunting. I grew up on a farm. It was me and my dad. That was who was there, and my dad was always working, and I had nothing else to do except from the age of seven. I had guns and dogs, and I had my dad's farm, the neighbor's farm. One neighbor on one side, and my granddad's farm was the other neighbor. And my granddad owned across the road down to the Waiha River. 
and my dad and my granddad and the other neighbour owned up to the back to the Kaimai foothills. So I had more, more possums, rabbits, uh, hares, pheasants, ducks, and, and even those first uh, sort of three years of shooting uh, sparrows, starlings, and miners were slug guns. And so it was $5 for 500 rounds. And I'd often go through a 500-round packet in a week, shooting a lot of targets, by the way, just, just walking around and shooting that rock and then that stick and then, oh, here's a bird, and then just round down range. <clears throat> um, and whether the dog was even doing much at the start, there was always a dog there, you know, and then um, it wasn't till I was probably about, it's hard to say, <clears throat> but probably like nine or ten that we started taking the dogs up into the bush and with, our, with slug guns and the air rifles and the dogs would put possums up the trees and then and we'd shoot the possums out of the trees. And that's probably the first real hunting with dogs. Um, and then by sort of, and I got my first 12 gauge when I was 11. So that was the beginning of shooting birds, um, game birds, you know. Obviously with the shotgun I was doing a lot, or like all year round, doing a lot of possums, rabbits, hares, uh, magpies <clears throat> every day basically, um, with the shotgun, and, and the dog was usually with me for that. Um, and I had multiple dogs between the ages of 7 and 15. There were probably oh, 10 to 20 different dogs in my life, and, pro and probably oh, only about 5 or 6 of those were real hunting dogs. Some of them... I started, I started with as an older dog, a few, couple of them I got from a pup. A couple of them were okay, most of them were a complete freaking shambles, including some real shambles. I mean, uh, a couple of dogs ended up killing the neighbour's sheep and got shot, and I saw dogs getting beat up and hidings for no reason, complete waste of time. Like I, I, So, <clears throat> again... It'd be a huge, I could do five podcasts on it or write a book on it, those years between seven and 15. What I'm trying to say here is um, <clears throat> I did a lot from a really young age. And and this year, I'm 37 now. Um, I turned 38 at the end of October. So this year actually marks 30 years hunting. Um. So as far as how do you get as good as me, you could actually, this is from my notes, you could actually argue, and, and so I had all that hunting growing up, I had a break away from hunting for a few years, which I actually needed, and then in my mid-20s, or actually early 20s, I started trapping full-time, and then I ended up uh, living in the Uawaras for years, um, trapping, shooting tons of, and, and now I had that big block of hunting seven or eight years as a kid and then I had a bit of a break away from it from the intensity of it I was still hunting off and on uh, and then when I got back to it now we're we're coming up 10 or 12 years of uh, in the second block that that's all I've been doing <clears throat> You know, um, so <laughs> my note here is actually, you could actually argue that I should be at least as good as I am and you could actually easily argue that I should be a lot better than what I am. Hunting for me has just always been a given. Uh, dogs took a, a fair bit more working out, but I had so much experience experience to fall back on good and bad that 
as I looked at how to actually do it properly from people that actually knew, I learned very, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so that's just a bit of background on me. Um, and here's a few a few other bits and pieces, and we'll move on and we'll get into other questions, but um, <clears throat> one big thing is most of all, learn from your mistakes and stay open to the idea that you don't know everything. You have to be objective and introspective about everything and keep your ego out of the way. Uh that, that whole thing's huge. As soon as you think you're awesome or you think you know everything, uh, you're done. <laughs> I can say that from experience too. Um, as soon as you think you know everything and you're aw awesome at it and you think everyone else is an idiot, you stop learning and the thing you're doing becomes not fun anymore. Um, you have to enjoy it and stay open to the idea that you can keep learning and just keep your eyes open and be present in it and, and, and be objective and introspective about everything you do and keep your ego out of the way. If you don't know what, what some of that stuff means, look it up being objective and introspective. <clears throat> um, some of the stuff is a bit cliche and it's whatever. If you don't, if you're not into this stuff, maybe flick forward. But um, this this is pretty cheesy and cliche, but it's it's pretty bloody good. Um, this is actually a Bruce Lee quote. Absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. Um, so you're always so absorb what is useful you always have to be learning and keep your eyes and ears open there's a lot of bullshit out there too so you need to know how to have a filter yeah there's a lot of bullshit out there man <laughs> there's a lot of bullshit out there there's a lot more bullshit than useful stuff as far as who's saying what and what, you know. <clears throat> um, and we'll get to this, the flip side of that soon too, but um, there's a lot of useful stuff out there too. Everything's half and half. You know, you need to be able to, again, you can always learn. <laughs> but you need a filter, man. And you, you'll always add what is specifically your own. You'll always be learning and adding to stuff, and that's your job, no matter what, you know. Um, so, again, cliche, cheesy, whatever, but it's a freaking brilliant quote. Absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. <clears throat> the best hunting quote I've ever got. Sorry, the best hunting advice I've ever got. This is uh, when I was living in the U.S. where I was trapping, and a guy come in. Uh, this is it. This guy is actually in my book, Hunting Lucky. Uh, this is um, Mike. That's his real name too. He's a real guy. He's a he's a real character, real person. Um, really good hunter, just a really smart dude in general, not only on hunting, uh, successful. You know, he was probably late 40s, early 50s, a um, lot of experience, a lot of life experience. He was an ex-color. He was a really good hunter. Um, and he was staying in the hut with me um, for a good few nights while I was trapping and he was going out hunting every day. Um, he'd leave early in the morning and then and then I'd go do my trap line and get back and he'd usually be there and he was a real storyteller and that and it was just me and him there in a hut you know there's obviously 
um, no power, no TV, no radio, nothing. So all you do is talk. Um, and most of that consisted of me asking him questions, and that's important too, and we'll get to that. Um, and I've always been like that, man. If I get in the right situation around the right person, <laughs> a particular, I'll ask a lot of questions, man, and I still do that. Um, and uh, but the best hunting advice I ever got, man, I was asking Mike <laughs> so many questions. I just continuously about what calibre, what what scope, what sort of gun, what sort of knife, um, do you, creek hunting, sidling, ridges, uh, get, what do you do with the wind, do you, do you always move, do you reckon, you, should you sit and watch clearings, what do you reckon about sitting and watching clearings, what do you, is, is the dawn hunt better than the evening hunt, would you hunt clearings in the middle of the day too, like what, winter, spring, you know, how do you raw stags in? What do you reckon? Like, do more, like, raw more, raw less? Do you wait? Do you move? Like, I had, I asked my, hit this dude so many freaking questions. And one night, <laughs> one night he, like, snapped and cut me off, like, in the middle of asking a question. And he said, look, the best hunter was never had like a specific skill or attribute or piece of equipment or trick that he used. <clears throat> the best hunter was always the one that worked hardest, that woke up early in the morning, left first, worked hardest all day and got back last and just did that every single day and barely ever had a day off. Um, and that's freaking true. Like, especially like the. I mean, the, at the end of the day, that's the best hunting advice we've ever had. Because the thing is, with that, if if you do that, and it's the same with dog training or whatever, just do the thing. And if you do that, uh, and you learn from your mistakes and you stay open to the idea that you don't know everything and you're always learning and you're always objective and introspective and then you just go out and do heaps of it, uh, you'll learn real fast because you're doing lots. And and if, you, if you're talking shooting deer or whatever, just getting good at anything, um. That that's some of the best advice we've ever had. It's it's exactly that. <clears throat> um, keep your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open. <laughs> that's one of the oldest tricks in the book, right? On anything, keep your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open. Um, and the next line is: you can get really good really fast. You really can. Um, I worked in the I had a I worked in the freezing works and the meat works as a butcher for about three years when I was about I worked there twice actually I worked there for a little bit when I was about sixteen, not for long, only a few months, and then I worked there for three years. I think I started when I was eighteen. Yeah, that'd be right maybe just about to turn 19, 19, 20, 21. And I left when I was, yeah, about, started somewhere about 19. It was about three years. Somewhere right around there. And um, <clears throat> there were guys that had been there for a long, long time that were good at their specific job or were okay there were look just being blunt. This and I'm hesitating there because it sounds freaking judgmental. Um, but but to be frank and honest, there were guys there that had been there a long time that weren't necessarily that good at it. 
and there were other guys that had been there for not that long at all that were really good at, at it, that were way better at it than some of the older guys that had been there for like 15 or 20 years. Uh, because they were just that sort of person that was um, curious, their mind didn't stop, and they just kept going and kept thinking about it. And instead of like talking shit or or mucking around and not doing much in between when they had downtime, they'd do their job really fast, and then they'd be over like having a little go at doing someone else's job. Hey, can I step in and have a go at scalping that head? How do you sharpen your knife? Give me a look. What do you reckon about this? What do you reckon about that? Asking questions. Um, you can, and, and, and I mean, experience is huge, but that's another thing. And, and, and is in going back to um, that best hunting advice thing, just work really hard. <clears throat> Sometimes it can take a long time to learn at something and get good at it by just working really hard um, and you can work smarter not harder and learn stuff really quick by asking questions and and one thing that's ha- that's <clears throat> is definitely not something I've done on purpose but I think it's something that's just happened over time and it's it's something that I, I've just recognized as being, uh, really important sometimes is um, that thing like keeping your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open. Um, me and Ben sort of touched on that in the Hunting Etiquette podcast when we were talking about like don't freaking turn up, <laughs> especially if you're a young fella, you know, don't. And I'm not perfect on all of this. I've screwed up loads of stuff, ton, plenty of times. And I've been that annoying young guy talking too much or whatever. Um, but there's been plenty of times that, that more through chance that I did keep my mouth shut at the right times and I just kept my eyes and ears open. And uh, because the thing is, is when if you, if you talk too much and you're too focused on proving yourself or going on and on about how uh, I've done this and I've done that and, and and trying to prove yourself, trying to say that you're a good hunter or you're trying to do that. People, other people shut their mouths and they feel the competition competitive side of it and they'll tend to shut their mouth. But if you if you're just quiet and humble and keep your mouth shut, They'll do all the talking, and and you'll learn a lot more like that. I'm not. I'm not. <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. But let's say in a situation where there's an old guy that has been hunting his whole life, and if you just respectfully ask questions and keep your mouth shut and don't big note yourself, he'll tell you a lot. But if you're constantly cutting him off and saying, yeah, no, nah, because I've done this or that, and oh, when I was here and I was there, or you cut him off and, and you act like you know everything already, he won't tell you anything. He won't bother because it's a waste of time. Um, and I've had that a few times in my sort of hunting career and being around other people and groups of other people. I've had it a couple of times in two two big blocks that I can look back at, at when I was working with other hunters that had done a lot of hunting. And um, I can be a bit different in social situations. Quite often I'm pretty freaking quiet, which is actually particularly... I, I am in some situations I'm freaking loud and talk way too much. Other situations I'm, I can be quite quiet and and sort of withdraw a little bit. <clears throat> um, and and then sometimes I've done so much freaking hunting from such a young age. I've done so much of it and I've done it as a job so much that 
There's times like with Mike where I'll ask a million freaking questions and you can't shut me up about it. There's a lot of times too when I don't really even want to talk about it or I don't feel compelled or excited to talk about it because it's kind of like a guy that's been a concrete layer for 30 years talking about, you know, when he finishes laying concrete for the day, he doesn't want to have like a excited talk about concrete all night. He wants to talk about something else. And there's times when I've been in an environment around quite a few, around people that have done a lot of hunting and there's been a lot of talk about hunting for a long time. I'm talking, I've, I've worked with guys for a year or two or a few several months or I've been around one guy for a few weeks and he's talk, spoke, talked a lot <laughs> in that time or they have talked a lot and they're going through photos and getting their laptops out and showing me all the talk, 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 and I'm just listening, oh yeah, cool, yeah, sweet, just listening, to the point of talking about keep your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open and you can get good fast, I've done that to the point where people have been offended about it afterwards, Like accidentally, not I'm I've never like planned to do it. I'm gonna hang out with these guys for a year and learn everything they know, and I'm just me there being me, and they're talking flat stick the whole time, and I've never, I've never had the big rant about I've done this and I've done that, and then later I've gone away. It's actually caused me issues at times, particularly when. I started making videos and the blueprint and making the big trailer saying I've done this and I've done that. Some people are like, "You, I didn't, I didn't know you've done that. Or ha have you?" Because the oldest trick in the book: keep your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open, and you'll learn a lot. Um. Another one is a genius will learn, this is a note and a quote, a genius will learn from an idiot, but an idiot won't learn from a genius. And what that means is you can learn from anyone. And that's a massive skill too. It doesn't, you'll, it, it doesn't have to be the best great white hunter, um, you know, that's, in a magazine or on a TV show or me on a freaking dog training podcast, you, you could learn one of the best things and it, it, it could, again, talking about keeping your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open, if you're in a situation in a hut full of people, usually the dudes that are, that are dominating the room, walking around the middle of the hut doing all the talking and big noting, uh aren't necessarily always the best hunter and they'll they'll probably be in all the awesome flash gears and all of that um it'll be the old guy in the corner with the ripped old swanee and the john bull boots that said nothing all night you know he, he's he probably knows more and just because someone comes across a certain way or doesn't seem they like they might be a bit off, but if you talk to them, and again, be open to that you don't know everything and that you can learn off anyone, you, it's what I'm saying. You'll be you might pick up the best gold piece of advice off the last person you'd expect, and and sometimes the the person that you would expect to learn the most off or, or you know from from their um, persona or who you think they might be uh, you might look back after a while and think man that wasn't that wasn't necessarily the best uh, learning environment or or just that you get it you can learn off anyone is basically what I'm trying to say uh, <laughs> that concludes our Josh's question. <laughs> um, and we will now revert back to ordinary programming. 
of straight dog training questions. But um, <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, I'm trying to think of how I can um, recap that. Basically, you can't replace experience. You've got to go and do it. You've got to learn from your mistakes. You've got to learn from your mistakes, look at back at what you do, be objective and introspective, stay open to the idea that you can always learn, absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. Work hard, keep your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open, and you can learn from anyone. And you can get really freaking good really freaking fast, and you actually can. <laughs> you can get so good so fast, people will be angry about it. Andy, uh, keen to understand a bit more on older dogs training. My two-year-old Steffi has always had an older dog around her. In brackets, a health house pet who is a typical needy Steffi. The dog I am training is anxious and not confident around change or noise. She is loyal and attentive towards me but lacks that self-insurance and confidence. We are at the walking in front stages in training but I don't know how to approach the clap noise modules with her. Any help would be awesome. Um, it's a little bit, and I had to read it a few times, and I fixed a couple of typos in it and stuff, but older dog. So it's an older dog, and I'm a bit confused about if it that my two-year-old Staffy has always had a, a older dog around her, the house pet, and I'm not sure if, if that's the two-year-old Staffy or that's the older dog or which one it is. But what I get from it is you've got an older dog that is loyal and attentive but lacks self-confidence and she's difficult around noise and different things and stuff like that. So um, one of the first things is there's a whole part in the blueprint on um, non-avoidance training. Print was the standoffish quiet pup, and he's still the standoffish quiet dog. He's one of the softest freaking dogs in a lot of ways. He's fine in the bush, and he's a bit soft in rivers. He, he does, he'd, he'll avoid water if he can. It's been a mild issue a couple of times. Um, but that same softness is what makes him so easy to handle and, and such a lovely dog and was so easy to train in that. But um, uh, there's a whole part on non-avoidance training in the blueprint. Um, I think it was on Prince's first trip back home he spewed up in the truck and then... He got a little bit of a thing with the truck. He wasn't big on the truck. And it, it was, it never got crazy serious, but you, it got to the point where I could walk over to the truck and call him and he wouldn't come to me. And then he just got all weird and didn't want to go in the truck. And I filmed a whole piece in the blueprint of showing print not wanting to come to the truck and me using the long line to pull him in and how to go about it. <clears throat> um. Pressure and praise is really important in following that principle properly in putting pressure on what you don't want and praise on what you do want. And one of the biggest things, I said this a lot of times in Q&As and in dog training, um, one of the biggest things is um, uh, don't reassure a dog when it's being unsure, you know. Um, 
that's the easiest thing to do. If the dog's unsure about something and, and you say, um, good dog, good dog, it's okay, it's okay, then it's taking that as good dog, good dog, be scared, be scared. That's in the blueprint several times. Uh, so make sure you're not accidentally reinforcing the negative behavior. It's really important. And if anything, you put pressure on it. Again, just follow the principle. Pressure on what you don't want. Praise on what you do want. You don't want your dog being uh, unreasonably scared of situations it doesn't have to be scared in. You know, you don't want that sort of weird neurotic behavior. Um, so you actually put pressure on it. And, and you know, in the case with Print, when he was not coming to me with the truck, um, when I say, here, Print, and he won't come because he's scared of the truck, I start pulling him in with the long line. Um, and pulling him in, that's pressure. Pressure with the long line. Pressure on what I don't want. If he leans back, he's going to get pressure pulling him into the truck. He's getting pressure pulling him towards me after he's heard that come command. So I don't want him not coming to me after I've given the come command and the long line's putting pressure on and pulling him in. Uh, also, you can actually like give a command of disapproval when the dog does, is being silly about being unsure about something. You have to be a little bit careful with it. And, and, and some of the stuff, there's a, do, there's a video on Big Game Indicating Dogs, How to Make a Gun Shy Dog Gun Steady. And I talk about the ins and outs of that because... It, 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 is, it is one of those things that once it gets really bad, like gun shy or a dog being really crazy and weird about something, it, it can get to into difficult situations. But 999 times out of 100, if you do everything right, you don't end up there. You know, you don't end up with it being that serious. But the keys are, is don't accidentally reinforce it by, by trying to reassure the dog when it's, uh, being silly, sometimes you can actually command disapproval. Ah, cut it out! Come here. You know, if if I'm if I'm um, even with the dog that's gun shy, and a, again, go watch that video because there's more to it than this. But sometimes, in some circumstances, if a dog's gun shy and I'm working with it to fix it, one of the things I can actually do is if I put it on a sit next to me and I've got a long line in my left hand, and I've got the twenty-two in my right hand, and I shoot it into the ground next to me, and, and if I put that dog on a stop, what do I do when the dog gets up off its stop without telling it to? I go, ah, command of disapproval, stay there. And if I put the dog on a stop, and it's meant to stay there, and I fire a gun, and it gets all silly and goes to pull away, what do I do? Good dog, good dog, it's all right. Nah. <laughs> I got to do the exact same thing. Hey, sit down. Command disapproval. If it goes to pull away when I fire the gun, ah, come here, sit down. And then as soon as it's sitting down, and I see it's, I don't want to pat it and say good dog when it's like sitting there but still all tense and weird. I want to go, ah, pull it back, sit it down, give it a bit of time, relax my body language, wait for the dog to relax, and as I see the dog's body language relaxing, then I can praise it. Good dog, good dog. And it's pretty crazy how easy it is to accidentally get that timing wrong with the pressure and praise there. Really little subtle things, like that's a classic example of it. You could go, ah, sit down, and you think, oh, the dog's sitting now, so I'll pat it. But if it's sitting and it's still tight as anything, and it's still super tense, you don't want to pat, praise it then, and that's correcting the thought. That's correcting the thought, because the dog is sitting, but it's still, it's still thinking, shit, I don't know about that, and you can actually watch it, until it starts relaxing a little bit and it's breathing or they'll go from being super tight, often mouth closed, ears back, 
and you'll see them, they can only hold that for so long. If nothing else is happening, if you go, ah, sit, and then nothing happens, they can only hold that tension for so long and they'll start relaxing and their mouth will open and they'll start breathing normally and you pat that. And and it's, it's never a case of the dog wanting to be scared of the thing. The dog's doing what it thinks is right and what we're doing by doing all that stuff properly and using good reading and timing and pressure and praise correctly, or actually, the dog actually realizes, oh, I don't have to be scared of this. And and sometimes you get these little breakthrough moments where the dog goes to pull away and you go, ah, come here, sit down. And then and the, the dog's all tight and, and it starts to relax and it just as it starts to breathe properly, you go, good dog, and you pat it. And all of a sudden, its whole body language will, will relax even more and it'll start panting much louder. And then you'll fire another shot. It'll lean away and you go, ah, stay there. And it'll relax quicker and you give it a pat and it really relaxes and then you fire another shot and it does nothing. And you do a couple more and then you come out two hours later and do it again and, it, and, it, and it's fine. And you do that for a few days and then a week later it's mint and you're shooting over its head and going crazy with it. But that's really important um, with those shy dogs that are that are like that. Um, that's the most common thing, man, is getting that pressure and praise around the wrong way and and um, uh, reinforcing the negative behaviour through trying to reassure it. Um, and again, that's in the in the blueprint. I can't remember what part it's in now. It's like. It's in the first half, maybe part three or four or five, somewhere around there. Um, and that's literally what's called non-avoidance training. Um, and that's all described to Helen gone in there and demonstrated as well. Um, Sebastian, still struggling to keep my pup walking dead straight in front, but think it's because she's always geared to go. So any advice on slowing her down a bit as she pulls on the line all the time? And as I do the double peep whistles, she sprints in front. So this is relatively common. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of other people have chimed, chimed in in the replies on this, and yeah, I'm having the same problem and, this and that, and um, my main note on this is patience, follow the program, trust in the process, it's all in there. <laughs> um, which it is, you know, and, and, and so I'd like to know how old the pup is, Sebastian, that would have been, how, how old is it and what part of the blueprint are you on? That's always a real, the breed, age, what part of the blueprint are you on is always really good to throw in with the questions. Um, but generally, if you're struggling to keep your pup walking straight ahead and they're always geared to go, any advice on slowing her down a bit as she pulls on the line all the time, um, and when I do the double peep, she takes off, that's pretty common with some dogs in the early stages and as you work your way through the blueprint and get to change of direction and then particularly non-communicative turns and stuff like that, um, you'll iron it out pretty quick and it's quite common early on in that stuff when you're just standing on the long line and keep moving in the same direction and that, that it takes a while to tidy up. Um, and once you start doing those turns and um, get out to bigger areas and your dog gets a bit of age on it, then you start doing scent work which really gives your dog a target to follow and stuff like that. It tidies up. So again, patience, follow the program, trust in the process, and and just keep going, man. And and again, with all this stuff, if you get stuck, let us know. And and if you get really stuck or, or something I've said doesn't make sense or I've, I've missed the mark somewhere, just let us know. Um, Renee, hi, Paul. We have a new GSP that is 11 weeks old now. I'm working some decent hours at the moment so my partner helps me out with taking care of the pup and is fully brought into training the pup under the blueprint. Trouble is she seems to be making progress with me but becomes really hypo with my partner, Jesse. Uh, the pup won't stop nipping at her ankles, rolling around and trying to play with me. She listens most of the time. 
but needs a bit of encouragement with the long line. Do you have any tips if we are both trying to pro- provide the training? Kim's replied to this. This is the beauty of the inner circle. Kim's replied to this pretty much straight away, and she said, I have the same issue, nips and jumps up and wants to play all the time with me and listens more and is better behaved with my husband. We are thinking it's our personalities coming into it. I'm a bit more energetic, happy and playful, and he is more calm, lower energy, and says it's my way or the highway. I'm not sure how I can project a more calm persona. Suggestions, anyone? I've got a suggestion. (laughs) Be more calm. (laughs) I I don't mean to be facetious on that, but how do you project a more calm persona as you be more calm, you calm down, and, and, uh, there's a, time, there's a time in dog training for um, good dog, good dog, and all that happy, playful, energetic stuff. Uh, I'm doing a lot of it in the bird dog training boot camp with Miko getting, keeping her coming in on retrieves and building confidence and drive and speed and all that stuff. Um, and it's just what the situation calls for, but with pups on the blueprint, with stop, with getting that nice stop, nice close range, everything about the blueprint is calm and controlled and you need to, dogs are like a mirror and that that too much intensity um, and playful is not good and and my my note on this is is, um, it's exactly what Kim says. Kim... (laughs) Kim's description of the way her she's saying the husband that the pup listens much better for her husband, and she says her husband is calm and lower energy and says it's my way or the highway. Another way of saying that is he's calm, clear, firm, and consistent. Really freaking important. Calm, clear. You could even ditch firm and just say calm, clear, and consistent. When you say sit, it means sit. You know, and if the pup gets up, you go up and then sit back down. It has to be black and white. You know, and as soon as the pup sits, it gets a pat and then it gets to move again. So we're not trying, I've said this so many times too, it's not like we're trying to get the pup to do anything horrible. A sit command is the pup sits on its nice walk and gets a pat and then you you go again. The sooner it sits, the sooner it's going to go, you know, and that's the whole uh, contradiction of it. And that's part of how a pup learns a sit command quickly is it's just a positive thing. And the longer it mucks around, the longer it's going to last. If it keeps getting up, it's just going to get... Put, put back down again. It's on a long line, so it can't go anywhere. Um, and and you've got to be calm in, some, in a lot of those situations. If you're too full on <laughs> and too much, oh, good puppy, and all that stuff, it it's two opposing forces. So Kim's basically answered it, you know, and, and but then she's also asked the question, like, how do I get the pup to react to me in the same way it reacts to my husband and my answer to that <laughs> is to uh, copy your husband um, as much as you probably love to, me to, love to hear me say that but but that's it you know look, look at how what I'm like with print you you and, you know, you sometimes give them a command to disapprove and uh, cut it out or whatever, but you get a lot of pats and praise and stuff too, you know. It's um, But you do. Calm, clear, and consistent. Super freaking important. And, and I think this question comes up again a bit later on too. Um, uh, someone else has the exact same question. My, my dog's really good for my husband, but not that good for me. How do I get it to be 
like it is with my husband, but with Megan, it's you do what your husband's doing. Uh, if it's and it's always there, for some reason it's always that way around uh, that I can think of. I can't think of a um, time when someone's a guy's been like my dog's real good for my wife, and it's exactly that because guys are more just oh, come on pup, let's go, let's go and do it, and and um, women are often more exactly what she said. What's her words? Uh, uh, I'm more energetic, happy, and playful, you know, and my husband's more calm, lower energy, and and says it's my way or the highway, which is basically being consistent. Um, that's what you got to do. That's it's really important. Um, and and I think actually it's more well in that first one is it. I think actually the other question I was referring to is more about jumping up and biting, a lot. And that's the thing is is it's one of those counterintuitive things where you want to ha- you want to have a nice positive relationship with your dog, so you try to be more happy and playful. But that often causes the pup to push the boundaries, and then that slowly gains momentum, and you actually end up in a lot of conflict with the pup, and it can really go south, like it really can. And uh, and you so you have a long term negative outcome, whereas uh, this is a huge contradiction of dog training. Whereas uh, if you're firmer and calmer and more blunt, things go a lot smoother, and you long term you actually have a lot more of a positive relationship with your dog, like a higher quality positive relationship. So it's 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 do the worst first. Um. Yeah, it's a real sort of blueprint classic. That uh, once, just give me one moment here. I'm back. <clears throat> Some headphones on. <coughs> Tyler, I'm wondering if you introduce a break or free dog type command once your dog has finished its training. Yes, we do, and it's in the blueprint. It's in the blueprint. Or is something that isn't introduced at all? No, it's not. It's in the blueprint. It's in there. Later on, I can't decide if giving them freedom in certain situations Example, free time at the beach after the blueprint training has been finished in its entirety or if this would be detrimental to the training in the long run. No, it's not. It's all in the blueprint. <laughs> it actually is, man, and, and I think it's part 10. I'm almost positive it's part 10 actually when we talk about how now and, and it going this bounces back off what I was just saying and the, that contradiction. And um, I've said this a lot of times in Q&As too. The amount of times that I've seen, I've seen dogs that end up getting put down because people have been tried to be too quote unquote nice to them early on, and 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 sometimes nice ends up being not training them and giving them too much freedom and responsibility before they're ready for them, ready for it, and that leads to massive serious issues that the so and the dog's freedom and responsibility has to be restricted for the rest of the dog's life because. It's been given too much too soon, and it and it's caused serious issues. Um, that's a one big part of what all my training's all about is is and what my all good dog training's all about is getting stuff right from the start, so you don't screw anything up. And when you do that, your dog gets a lot of freedom and responsibility and has a really good life for it, the rest of its life. You know, um, and and you know, I've spoke again. It gets kind of cliche and. Uh, you know, analogies are, can be weird, but um, it's that analogy of, of you don't just let a three-year-old or five-year-old kid go nuts doing all this crazy, st- whatever they want, because it's a kid, you know, you, you, you've got to um, <laughs> look after them and put rules and boundaries and things in place, otherwise stuff would just be crazy. Um, 
And it's the same in the blueprint and, and that exact thing is in part 10 and we talk about now that Prince fully trained, he's got a bit of age on him, he's matured a bit, all his commands are set up, um, it, all he's got all that training so much so that uh, if, if I do um, put a bit of pressure on a print, slow down or whatever, um, he will... And but then and and, and that's it and and um, I mean my dogs every day get big runs all around town on the beach and in the dunes and out at the parks and stuff all off leash running around basically like idiots within reason, and I can always call them back, you know I can always call them back. I'm never in that situation where my dog just takes off, and I'm that dude running up the beach like. Fenton, <laughs> Fenton. <laughs> uh, I'm never, I'm never that guy because my dogs are trained, but they do get lots of freedom, and 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 we do introduce the way you go command, and it's in part ten of the blueprint. Um, couple of notes on it. Here's my notes on this. It's in the blueprint. It's very important to not do it too early, but you can definitely do it. Um, and I yeah, and talk about my dog's lifestyle now, which is. They've, they've got pretty freaking good lives, man. Anyone that knows me and knows my dogs, the, the, they sleep inside every night. They cruise around. I've got a dog-proof section. Um, but they're only ever in their kennels when I'm not home. Um, and and they get big free runs around at the park and on the beach and stuff, and they're living the freaking dream. And then... When we go hunting, it's a good time too because they just they know their job and they know what to do and they love it, and I love hunting with them and it's all just they just love it because it's I'm never yelling at my dog I'm never going back to like growing up as a kid, man I remember hunting with dogs sometimes and the whole hunt would just be you you coming home just like sweating and red in the face with the dog walking behind you with the tail between your legs because you've been screaming at it because it done something completely ridiculous and totally ruined the whole freaking day because it wasn't trained and and you end up screaming at your dog while it's chasing something three paddocks over and it, you're just about to shoot something and the dog broke and put it up out of range and it's just a freaking mess man you know and I never have that with my dogs I really don't I really don't I've never had a big screaming match with print or it, oh, he's had you know if you've watched my videos it's in the blueprint putting the long line back on him sometimes and little commander disapproval calling it back in hey slow down <laughs> you know you have your little moments but they're very mild and 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 hunting's is just freaking enjoyable with them you know um it's really important to get it all right. Um, Anna, hey. Oh, yeah, this here. Anna, hi, Paul. My dog is doing well on the blueprint so far, but the main problem I have is she keeps jumping up. Any chance she gets... Oh, but she keeps jumping up any chance she gets. I growl it, but she still does it a good few more times. Is there anything else I can do or will I just stick to growling her? Thanks, Anna. Sorry, I'm just rereading and thinking about it. Because there's another question too that's similar and could be linked to this as well. So Anna, if you're listening to this, keep listening because there's a couple of sides to what this could be. Um, basically, dog's doing well on the blueprint, but the main problem I have is it keeps jumping up. Any chance I growl her, but she still does it a few, a good few more times. Is there anything else I could do, or will I just stick to growling her? And I, my note on this is it sounds very similar to Renee's question and Kim's answer, and what I said there is probably very useful here, in that maybe your energy is a bit high and bubbly and energetic and not quite calm and firm and consistent enough. Um, and the dog's just not quite, usually that's it, the dog's not really taking you seriously enough. I've basically, let me think about this, I've pretty much never had 
ongoing problems with this. I've had this pop up here or there. I've never had ongoing problems with it, and I've mucked around with a lot of dogs. Um, and it really is. It's usually just a tone thing. But another thing is um, is another side to this too. It can be, where's this question? Adam, Paul, my dog decides it's Zoomies time just randomly. I haven't worked out what the trigger for it is, but just wondering what the best way to deal with this is. At the moment, I've just been giving her a sharp check on the long line and telling her off, but it will take a few checks on the long line to get her to stop. What is the best way to deal with this and to get rid of the behaviour altogether? Dog is five month old GSP. My note on this is often a result of overtraining and too much pressure. Try lightening up without causing bad habits. Um, <laughs> so it's the opposite. It's the opposite. Uh, there's, there's, and that's why being calm in dog training is so freaking important. Always using the minimum amount of pressure or praise required to get the job done. That's that's part of the principle of pressure and praise. Reading and timing of pressure and praise is the application, is, is the, it's the reading of the dog and then the timing and measure of the application and releasing of pressure and praise using the minimum amount of pressure or praise required to get the job done. <laughs> That's quite, a, I've sort of uh, added to that over the years. Um, but that's what it is. And, and the application and releasing of pressure and praise, because that's very important. I saw a video in the inner circle uh, with, I think, it, what was it, a Pomeranian? Is that what it was? This, this real cute, fluffy little toy dog and a, and a guy... Um, um, training it on the blueprint. It'd probably be an awesome, awesome dog, like real little and quiet. Yeah, it is a Pomeranian. Google Pomeranian. We've got someone training a Pomeranian on the blueprint, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, but I was going to comment, but it, I mean, it looks great all in all, but... Um, He's saying sit and the dog's sitting, but he's still got his hand out, and that hand out can be perceived by the dog as pressure. As soon as the dog does what you want it to do, all the pressure should come off, and all your body language and your tone and and, and even what you're thinking, you've just got to back everything off. And um, I've told <laughs> I've told a story too before about a guy that was saying um, he was talking like this in a one on one. I don't know what it is with my dog. He's just really intense. He just won't calm down. And I'm doing these stop drills, and he gets pissed off and he jumps up at me. Honestly, my dog just won't calm down. He's really full on. It just really annoys me. I've been trying really really hard training the whole time. I I do lots of training. I train all the time. I watch the blueprint. Do everything properly. <laughs> Uh, he was a really full-on guy and um, really full-on, man. So everything's got to be a balance and and um, if you're too too bubbly, you know, come on, puppy, let's go training, let's go, and, and not firm enough and consistent enough, that won't work and the dog will just take the piss and... and uh, I did that podcast on on the evolution of wolves and and how that affects dog training, talking about evolutionary psychology and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> basically just that dogs are have genetically evolved to not follow whether if you're too full on or or not not serious enough, they just don't want to follow you. They just act up if you're off. You've got to be right. You've got to be calm enough, but not wishy-washy. Um, you've got to be firm enough, but not over the top. 
It's got to be just like well, it's got to be just right, you know. And it's not an impossible thing. Um, I I saw a, a show. Um, it's on YouTube. It's my mum told me about. It. It's called Old Dog, and it's about a dog trainer, um, a sheep dog trainer, a sheep dog trialist, trialist, um, Paul Sorensen really well known and very very successful sheepdog trialist in New Zealand and um, in the, in actually it, it was interesting because in the blueprint my, my favorite dog training quote is from Les Knight um, and it's not only a dog training quote it's just a life quote um, but it's uh, his quote was discipline is a matter of self-discipline when you think of discipline oh, I'm being disciplined uh, or I'm disciplining my dog uh, you think of disciplining the dog, cut it out, or being hard on it, or whatever. But and and I sort of, I just took what I thought that Les Knight quote meant, and sort of elaborated on it a little bit, and basically just said that, um, uh, your dog's discipline is a direct reflection of your discipline in raising and training it. Not you disciplining the dog, you disciplining yourself in raising and training the dog. How disciplined are you in your training? And that's not like being regimented, oi, sit over there, get back. That's you doing everything correctly. Being calm or being more consistent or training your dog every day or not letting it off the long line when you shouldn't, or, or doing enough introduction to gunfire, whatever it is, it's you doing the job properly. Your dog, the level of your dog's discipline is a direct reflection of your level of self-discipline in raising and training your dog. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, digressing massively here. I've almost forgotten where I started. But... Um, I, I honestly have. Uh, where the hell was I? I know it was Paul Sorensen. And how I got to Les Knight and that quote from Paul Sorensen is in that program about Paul Sorensen. Oh, that, that, oh, I'm back. I'm back. I remember. Paul Sorensen was showing all his trophies in an old photo of his and he's standing next to Les Knight. So that's the connection there. Um, and and there was some footage of Paul working in that video. You can rent it or buy it on YouTube. It's called Old Dog. Type in Old Dog Paul Sorensen. If you just type in Old Dog, it didn't come up for me. I typed in Old Dog Paul Sorensen into YouTube and, and it come up. And you, you've got to rent it or buy it. You can rent it for like five or six bucks and watch it. Awesome. Little little video. Um, there was some footage there, and and there was a guy in a in a yard with his dog and some sheep, and and it seemed like the the issue that this guy was having with the dog it was just a little bit too much of a handful, and it was too full on, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, He's like, ah, no, like, I can't remember what the dog's name was, Ch Chief or something. He's like, Chief, Chief, Chief. This guy's quite full on. And he's making lots of noise, and the do this dog's putting too much pressure on these sheep, and it's all a bit messy. And then Paul gets in there, barely says anything. Just Chief, Chief, sort of waves a stick around and walks backwards and forwards a couple of times. <laughs> and instantly the dog's just calm and everything's nice. And, and the guy, it's like a little one-on-one -on -one training session that Paul, Paul's doing. And, and uh, uh, the guy's watching, and he said, it, this, it's actually pretty annoying <laughs> how easy it is, or when you, when you actually see it done properly and how easy it is. And that's just all of that stuff that I'm talking about. His, Paul's tone is just perfect. 
and that's the that's the whole thing. Like there's two there's 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 heaps to it, right? There's you have to know how to do the thing, step in and step out, and walk around in circles. There's a step by step, uh, practical theoretical stuff to it. I've talked about this a few times before, but that reading and timing and measure and and your whole tone and and um, body language and everything is freaking huge. That's the difference between someone that gets by and someone that's a uh, Paul Sorensen. Uh, and it, it's... It's all just body language and tone. And you're reading the dog and the dog's reading you and straight away it's just a done deal. Um, so like the zoomies and the jumping and nipping, it could be being too full on and you can overtrain that that one there, that zoomies and then um, that can be, and he's saying... Uh, at the moment, I've just been giving her a sharp check on the long line and telling her off, but it takes a few checks on the long line to get her to stop. That sounds like more, maybe a bit of overtraining. It's a young GSP, five months old, classic age for it. Quite a full-on dog. Um, and sometimes it's just too much, too much. Um in the bird dog boot camp, I've had a really interesting situation with Miko where early on she took heaps of Miko, good girl, good girl, Miko, come, Miko, come, to keep get her coming in for the delivery. And I had to do lots of holds with her and I had to give her heaps of big pats while she was holding the dummy. And then I reached this point, and it happened pretty quickly where I had one session where delivery wasn't quite as good and I was having a little bit of trouble with the delivery with some dummies and she reached the point where she actually realized she clicked how to do it all. And now she just wanted me to shut up and get on with it. And she didn't want to do all the big pats and the holds and the mucking around. And I just had to stop one session, have a couple of days off, thought about it, worked it out. And then I went back out and just did way less and basically did the opposite of what I had to do to make it to work two weeks ago. And she took off again. And, and started retrieving like crazy and delivering and started retrieving all of the dummies and whole ducks and, and I was away again. It was just a tone thing. And and realising, it comes back to that, that um, introspection thing, being objective and introspective and always looking back at yourself, you know, because the thing with the dog is... Uh, <laughs> You can't make the dog do anything. It, so it, you've always got to change what you're doing. If something's not working, it's always what can I do to to fix it, to change it. Um, and it's it's yeah, it's always us, and it has to be because again, you can't <laughs> you can't um, force a dog to do anything. You've got to work out what you can do to trigger the dog to want to do the right thing, you know. Um, but anyway, um, so Anna's dog's jumping up and she growls, but it still does it a good few more times. So Anna, it could be that you need to be more firm and more calm, calm, firm and consistent. It could be that you've been too firm and you actually need to lighten up a little bit. Um, it's pr It'll generally be one of those two things. Yeah, and, and it's funny too because you, you can, you can't, it's, it's funny how much sometimes you can lighten up in dog training and keep making really good progress. You can just go from, from um, you know, trying to, you know, from 
have trying to keep the dog within three meters to give it a little bit more leeway and just do a, a week or ten days and and let it let it move around a bit more and five five to seven meters type of thing, you know. Um, if you're doing five stop drills in fifteen minutes, do three stop drills in twenty five minutes. You know, so there's more just relaxed walking in between drills. Um, make sure you're letting the pressure off. As soon as the dog's sitting and, and, and doing what it's told, all that pressure's coming off. And then it's just nice, calm praise. It, it is, there's, a, there's a real scale there on how tight and tense a training session can be and full on and you can make certain good progress to a certain point with that and sometimes different dogs need a lot of that and then other dogs get to a point where you need to back off a little bit and they'll actually make better progress like that hope that makes sense um Mariska I hope I'm pronouncing that right uh, hi Paul, we have a GSP Labrador Hunterway Cross, almost 12 weeks old. While he is doing really well with the training, we have a problem of him being scared of literally everything. If you cough, sneeze too loud, drop something by accident, or the sprinklers turning on while training, etc., He will duck, put his tail between his legs and try to run away or hide behind anything he can. We normally try to ignore the behavior and hold on to his leash and try to get him back to focus on the training. But most times his attention will be completely gone. Any tips? My two notes on this are definitely don't ignore it, definitely don't reassure it. And that's the, the biggest thing. Um, we normally try to ignore the behavior and hold on to his leash. That's ignoring that stuff is terrible. It's really bad. The only, the only worse thing you could do other than ignoring it is trying to reassure it, saying "Good dog, good dog, it's okay," which is "Good dog, be scared, be scared." Ignoring it's pretty freaking bad too. And and so you're saying you're, you're holding on to a leash. So you're saying a, a, a sprinklers turn on while we're training or I drop something by accident or I cough or I sneeze. If Again, it comes back to that same example. If, I'm, if I've got the dog on a le short leash on a heel walking along the footpath and someone in the house to neck right next to me closes a car door, and my dog freaks out and leaps out to the end of the lead, and which causes to jerk my hand. I don't, I don't, I definitely don't ignore it, and I definitely don't say, "Good dog, good dog, it's okay." When that happens, the car door slams, and the dog neurotically leaps to the side, yanking on my arm. I go, "Cut it out." pull it back in what the hell are you doing and I walk dead calmly until we're completely out of the situation the dog's walking normally and then when the dog has improved then I pat it and the next time it does it I do it again cut it out and keep walking and then I pat the dog when it's relaxed pressure on what I don't want praise on what I do want and and eventually sometimes something will happen and the dog's reaction won't be too bad to it and you can praise it. Or a very mild stressful situation will happen and the dog will just keep itself together and you'll see it. You, you can see these moments where the dog's right on the edge and it's 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 when, when you're bringing a dog out of those situations, um, you know, fixing a gun-shy dog or something. And they, they do something weird and you go, cut it out, come here, sit down. And and it's, you can actually see them sometimes like halfway in between being scared and trying to relax and they're sort of like can almost be a bit shaky but their mouth's trying to open and they're trying to start panting but they're, 
they're still tight, and and you can almost like, good dog, it's all right, and and you can let them know through tone and body language that you are realizing that they're trying to come out of it, and then they realize that, and then come right out of it, and you go, good dog, and it's almost like they come out of convulsions and <sighs> and they'll start panting, and you can almost see them going, holy shit. Uh, I didn't need to be acting like that in that situation. There's nothing to be scared of here. And again, it's that real counterintuitive thing of def and like my two notes, definitely don't ignore it and definitely don't reassure it. And you've got to put pressure on what you don't want and praise on what you do want and you've got to have really good reading and timing of that. And, and and read those really subtle things, you know. Um, I hope that makes sense. I'm not going to keep going on and on about it and round and round in circles because I've talked about that whole thing a lot in this podcast. Um, yeah, we've, I scrolled down and then back up again. Um, <clears throat> now I'm trying not to miss anyone. Um, Amy, I I have a strong eyed heading bitch, and we are starting on chapter five. Any advice on sheep aversion training? I tried to avoid areas with sheep because. While she is happy to watch and leave them feeding, if they run, it is all on and she is off. My notes here are, how is it all on and she is off when she's on a long line and you have full control of her? Three question marks. <laughs> you know, uh, and what is it's all on and she is off? It sounds like she's chasing them. She's on chapter five, she's seven months old. And, and I've spoken about this a lot in Q&As and, and it's in the blueprint, is um, if you're ever in that situation where the dog's in a, in a... If you're ever in a situation where you, you're not a thousand percent sure that you've got full control of the dog through com voice command, you, you sh should be holding the end of that long line. <clears throat> you know, so if your dog's a little bit sketchy around sheep, you should be holding the end of that long line. And if it's all on and she's off, she's just going to hit the end of that long line. And if she's, if it's really all on and she's really off, she should just do a backflip at the end when she hits the end of that long line and look back at you and go, holy shit, well, I won't do that again, will I? You know? Um... But really, you should never be in that sort of a situation. And um, my next note is I train print around cows the whole time. It, and, and it's not ideal, but it shouldn't be a factor. It really shouldn't be a factor. You know, you've always got that pup or dog on a long line. And um, in the blueprint, we do introduction to cows. And we show exactly how I do that, like exactly. Starting right from having the cows on the other side of a fence in another paddock, right up to the point where we're walking in amongst the cows with print. Um, and it's all in there in detail, and I have my big long talks and rants about it, and and then show you video and talk about it while I'm doing it, and demonst fully demonstrate and explain all in detail step by step on how I do it with print with cows and the blueprint, I would just do that exact same thing, Amy, With, but with the sheep, that exact same thing. And then we've also got the non-target species aversion training in there too. Not the Kiwi aversion training, the non-target species aversion training where we do that work with dead possums and rabbits and stuff. And same thing, big long explanation, then big long video showing and me doing it all with print. Um, I would look at those two sections and how that's all done 
and I would do that exact same thing with the sheep. Um, and it shouldn't be a, a, a heading dog shouldn't be any dog really, but particularly a heading dog shouldn't be too bad at all to get it to calm down around sheep. Um, and and if you're ever in that situation where it could be all on, the dog should come off. You should have a firm grip of the end of that long line and a good couple of wraps, and you've got full control of the dog, and it's on a it's on a long line, you know. Um, that's the whole idea of it. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I think is that it. Oh no. Couple more. Back to Adam and the Zoomies. Yeah, so I can't remember. I went all over the place with that, but so that could be it, Adam. When your dog just decides it's Zoomie time randomly and you haven't worked out what the trigger is, but you're just wondering what the best way to deal with it, you've been checking it on the long line. And again, often that trigger man is too much pressure and the dog's basically going crazy. Um, it's like that dude that I said that his dog just wouldn't calm down and he couldn't work out what it was because he was so full on. Now, you not might not be saying a thing, but you might be a bit... And it, this is a total guess. I'm not pointing the finger. I might be totally off on this. Um, and it might be something else. So again... If what I'm saying is just way off, let us know, throw it in, the, in a circle and we'll talk about it and work it out. But it's either, it's generally either too bubbly and fun and not enough structure or it can be overtraining and too much pressure. Um, too many drills over and over, too rigid, not enough space, too much pressure, not enough praise. Too many drills, too close together. Um, and my notes on this is often a result of overtraining and too much pressure. Try lightening up without causing bad habits. Just a little recap on that. Um, Marky? <laughs> M-A-R-K-I-E. Marky? Um, I'm pretty... I'm, I'm pretty... I'm a pretty bad reader and speller, to be honest. Um, hey team, 15 week old heading dog, keen to get it going on deer and ducks. Some people would be like, a heading dog on ducks? What the hell? Um, I've seen heading dogs that would give a decent lab a good run for its money on fetching ducks. <laughs> Fly was an absolute beast in the water and retrieved like mad and was birdie as hell. It's it's a it's a it's a common misconception or probably more commonly just something that no one's even really thought about. But hitting dogs can exactly what I just said, can be very strong in the water, very strong <laughs> retrievers and birdie as hell. It's hard case, um, believe it or not. So that's that's cool. Got a 15-week-old heading dog, keen to get it going on deer and ducks, doing some retrieving with a tennis ball at the moment, so hyping her up to fetch is going well. She's starting to retrieve well. Will this stuff up her training? My notes on this is, yes, if you're letting her auto-retrieve, and the bird dog boot camp will be out soon. <laughs> um, I've spoken about this a lot in Q&As too, but... Um, uh, doing retrieve work with an up and coming deer dog isn't necessarily a a real issue, and and but there's a lot to it, man, and that's why the net probably the next big frontier for me, particularly after doing the bird dog boot camp, and what I'm going to do with that and stuff, and it has been for a long time, even before the bird dog boot camp, is um a versatile the versatile gun dog blueprint. I've spoken about it before. Um, we even got like some website names and different things set up. Like it's that's that's the next main thing, um, because you you hundred percent can do it all, 
Um, but it's a lot of work, man. And there's I've got a kamikaze fly around in here, in here. I I um I fly spray too, so he's like half dead, freaking. Um, you a hundred thousand percent can do it all. Uh but there's just a, and, and there's 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 a lot of different ways to do it too. You can do it either way around. You could do all the bird dog stuff and then do the the deer dog stuff after. You could do the deer dog stuff first and do the the bird dog stuff after. Um, and there's pros and cons to both each way. You could do the two things simultaneously. Um, it's one of those things that the deer dog stuff on its own is is if I said, uh, I, was trying to, I was thinking about this the other day and I was trying to think of a way. So let's just say out of 10 units of difficult, let's say training a deer dog is 10 units of difficult and training a bird dog is 10 units of difficult. Training a bird dog and a deer dog with the same dog, doing the two things at the same time, becomes like 40 units of difficult. It's not you don't just add the two together, and it's it's uh, you know what I'm saying. It 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 you don't just add. The, it's not like two one plus one equals two. It's like one plus one equals three or four. Um, and I mean, there's give or take on that. You could also say, oh no, nah, but it shouldn't be like that because if you're training the bird dog or the deer dog, then some of the deer dog stuff will help with the bird dog stuff, or some of the, you know, or you've got all your basic foundation, so therefore, and, and there is that, there's that side of it. Um, like with Miko, I've been able to do the bird dog, the basic, and here's the thing, I've been able to do the basic bird dog stuff with her very quickly and easily because she's already had an awesome foundation of, the training that we did with her in the Palmico dog guide. But again, that's basic bird dog training. And then if you add the deer dog stuff onto that, and then it, it depends how, and it's so open, man. It's so huge because there's so many different types of bird dogs and there's so many different types of running them, training them, uh, hunting over them, so it's a complicated topic, is what it is. And I was having this conversation with a guy about um, he wants he's using the blueprint with a pig dog. He's already got pig dogs, but um, he wants a handier dog that's closer to him with a better bond and he's just interested in the blueprint and he's he was going to train the dog with the blueprint and then transition into pig hunting and we're talking about that. And um, I was saying, man, it's one of those things I could give a really straight, simple answer to. Oh, just do this or that, man, and you'll be sweet. But it would leave so much open for him to come back and go, man, I did this and you said you said this, and but this has happened. But that's happened. Or but this is there's so many possible scenarios or directions. That's what makes it complicated. Is how are you gonna do it? Which way around are you gonna do everything? And then having said all that, that whole rant about twenty one plus one equals four. If you do it all a certain way, it's totally doable and not even that complicated. once you know what you're doing or once I know exactly what you're going to do, you know. So, um, I'm, and, he, the, and the reason I'm going round and round in circles on this and rambling is because there's no short answer. There's no way of answering all of that in, a, in even a five-hour podcast. You know, it's more like, uh, you know, if the, uh, deer dog blueprint took me 15 to 18 months to make the 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 versatile gun dog blueprint I'll probably work on that for about three years like seriously I'd do a year of 
big training for big game indicating dog with a whole bunch of other stuff thrown in plus preparation for bird dogs a bird dog in that and then I'll get the dog going as a big game indicating dog and then in the year in the second year I would do all my bird dog training and get a bird dog a bird hunting season under the dog's belt and then in the third year I would do all of my advanced bird dog stuff so by the time the dog's three it it will be a, a pretty freaking good big game indicating dog and bird dog and then by the time it's four or five it'll be really freaking good at all of it um But going back to this question, there's a lot to it, man. There's a, and I don't want to go on and on about it and turn it into some big daunting thing because it's not. It's really not. You know, if you look at someone that's done the blueprint or the Palmico dog guide and then wants a duck dog to fetch ducks and point and flush and fetch pheasants and be pretty freaking good, I've just done it with Miko in like six weeks. And it's relatively relaxed and easy going. <clears throat> but the thing is, is there's potentially a lot to it depending on what you're doing. So back to this question, 15 week old heading dog, keen to get it going on deer and ducks, doing some retrieving, retrieving with the tennis ball at the moment, Hyping her up to fetch, it's going well. She's starting to retrieve well. Will this stuff up her training? What my answer is yes. If you're letting her auto retrieve, the bird dog boot camp will be out soon. Auto retrieve is if you're not if you're just throwing the ball and the dog's just breaking at the throw and running out, picking it up and bringing it back. And you're saying you're hyping her up to fetch. It's going well. Starting to retrieve well. Uh, the way I did it in the bird dog boot camp was Miko's first, re her first one or two were without steadiness and then literally, and a dog shouldn't start to retrieve well after a while, the retrieve's all back-chained. Back-chained off the, the hold and the delivery. So you teach a hold first, which is the dog holding if you're using a tennis ball. I actually used a tennis ball. They can be good to start with. Um, they have their pros and cons, but tennis ball's fine. Um, it all starts with the dog holding the tennis ball and you get your hold sorted to the point where the first time you throw it, the dog runs out, picks it up, and brings it back. And then, and I, yeah, you can start the retrieve from a pup, and that's fine and okay, and I would do that. I would start doing basic hold stuff and getting the, the pup used to holding stuff and feathers and different stuff like that. For an all-rounder, a, a dog that I want to be a, big, a good big game indicating dog and then transition into a bird dog, I would prop. I don't know, I'd have to think about it and that's why I'm saying I, I don't know when I'll be doing the versatile gun dog blueprint. But in the bird dog boot camp, for example, I didn't do any retrieve work with Miko till she was, I can't remember exactly, but probably like eight, nine, ten months old. You know? Um... And then I started off with hold work and and because she already had a bit of age on her and I did the hold first. She, her first retrieves were good. She was running up, picking it up, bringing it all the way back and I was steady. So Miko sit, throw it, make her wait and then send her. And I've done all of her retrieve training solid and steady like that. Um... So I'm not really creating any steadiness issues anywhere. That's the biggest thing, man, without <laughs> rambling on for hours. 
that's the biggest thing. Exactly. Like, don't let the dog auto retrieve. Don't just throw it and let the dog chase to the throw. It's got to be sit. You throw it. The dog waits and you send it. Um, <clears throat> with an older dog, if you do everything right, it's not too bad. But one and every dog's different. But sometimes keeping the dog steady to the throw involves you go get some. If the dog gets to go every time, even if you make it wait, keep it steady, and you say sit, throw, wait, release, sit, throw, wait, release, sit, throw, wait, release. If the dog gets to go and get every single one, the dog knows it's going to go get every single one, and eventually it'll break. And and a re- and Miko's done that a couple of times, and every time she's done that, I just go pick a couple up. Um, in some super pedantic, full on. Uh, bird dog training systems where they're looking at and, and where they're training with the view that the dog could potentially be trialed where it has to be a million hundred percent steady if you throw it and one day in an exciting situation the dog breaks even if you've got a stop command even if you've got a stop command and the second the dog breaks you can go Miko sit and they stop sorry mate you just lost the trial that day uh, or whatever, if you just want an extremely highly trained bird dog that never breaks, um, in an extreme case, they will say you only ever let the dog go get 50% of the th- retrieves. You go get half of them. Then, it, and it's crazy too how, like like with Miko, I've, I haven't done anywhere near half. I haven't gone and got anywhere near as many as I should have. Um, but again, I'm, I'm training her, I'm doing her bird dog stuff at three years old. She's three. I did a little bit of retrieve training with her, a tiny bit. I'm talking like three to five sessions of like six or eight retrieves and a, and a bit of hold work so she knew how to do it. I did that in her first year, probably around seven or eight, nine months old, maybe 10 or 12 months old, somewhere there. I honestly can't remember. I'd have to look. Um, and then I, I picked it up again at three. But that's the beauty of having that foundation of training that we that you already have right from a pup, starting a dog off on the long line, doing everything properly. Anyone that's trained a dog on the blueprint and done a decent job of it, um, the bird dog boot camp's just going to be a, a piece of cake for them and... and um, you'll be able to get your dog retrieving really well and pretty damn solid <coughs> in six or eight weeks. Um, and the bird dog boot camp is designed so you're not screwing up your deer dog for it too. And that's why I did it. I mean, I was going to do train me, do it with Miko anyway, like tra- train her to be a bird dog because she's perfect for it and I want a bird dog. It was an afterthought, like I, I got Miko, did the Power Miko dog guide and then by the time she was about 12 or 18 months old I just saw what she was like and I've been getting, I've, I've always shot birds right from a very young age but I've been always wanting to get back into it properly. I've dabbled off and on over the last few years but it's, I've never had good spots, I've never had enough time to do it properly and I've never had a decent dog either since I got rid of Tessa my old black lab, or my last black lab that I had a few years ago. Um, but uh, where I was going with that was I was doing it anyway, and the re- what I'm saying is why did I make the bird dog boot camp? I made it because I was doing it anyway, <clears throat> and it would have been silly to not film it and put it in the bird dog boot camp because I know Miko's going to be freaking good. She is good. <laughs> she is good. And um, I know you guys are going to be like, how did you train Miko? What did you do? What? Uh, so so I've made the, the bird dog boot camp and the bird dog boot camp is me training my own bird dog and I'm going to use Miko on 
deer as well. I don't. I, I was going to film that, but I don't think I'm going to. I don't think I'm going to. I'm just. I think I'm just going to leave it as. If you want a deer dog, you can get the deer dog blueprint, and then if you want to train it to be a bird dog, you can just get that. I was going to make a deer dog boot camp. I might do. Still, I, we actually filmed some stuff for it. But as I've made the bird dog boot camp and thought about it more and how big the bird dog boot camps ended up being, it's it's going to be like a 15 or 20 hour series. So the same size, if not bigger than the blueprint. Um, yeah, I think I'll just leave it. So if, if for the deer dog stuff, you can get the deer dog blueprint. For the bird dog stuff, either starting from scratch or on top of the blueprint, or for someone like um, Mark, Marky, how do I say how do I say that? Let me know. Uh, for someone like Marky, I would just say get the bird dog boot camp, man. Either don't keep doing it and don't let your dog auto retrieve, or get the bird dog boot camp, which will be out soon. Which will be out soon. Amy, um, g'day, I'll be hunting both reds and fallow with my dog, should I be using both the scent, should I be using both in scent training or just with one until she gets the hang of it, many thanks for your help in advance. My, answer, my note on that is you could use both and there's only upside to that but it's not a huge deal and that's basically it. Um, it's not a huge deal if you if you were hunting fallow, and you just used you were, you wanted to hunt fallow in the end, and but you could get a bit of deer skin off a of red, and you just use that. The dog will hunt fallow when you get there anyway. It's close enough, and it's the same thing. And dogs will hunt anyway, and the skin work is really an exercise for you both, you guys, to tidy up on your skills and learn how to work together and all of that sort of thing. Um, although, you know, because there's that whole argument, you can't teach a dog about hunting and stuff like that, but you can definitely help them out and tidy them up. And I think the scent work is way, way worth doing. Um, uh, so it's exactly that. You could use both, and it would be good. Like if you have some around and you're doing the skin drags anyway, do one with red, then one with fallow, and there's only upside to that. But if you can't get the two... Or for whatever reason, and you just do it with one or the other. Or even if you had some seeker, and you you make shot a seeker and gave you a bit of seeker skin, and you were going to hunt reds and fallow, you'd be fine. It'll be fine. Um, I think that's it. Um, I feel like this has been a bit of a crazy Q and A all over the place, and I've rambled heaps. But um, then in the past, when I say that, people say the rambles are the best bits. So it is what it is. Um, Josh's question at the start was pulled out a whole heap of really interesting stuff um, and that's that so thanks everyone for all the questions thanks everyone that signed up to the blueprint and the Palmico dog guide uh, it is Saturday night the 24th of April and opening weekend of duck shooting is next Saturday uh, and I've been filming the bird dog boot camp over the last six to eight weeks. Um, and I will be pretty flat out over bird season, just doing a heap of hunting over Miko and filming all of that for the bird dog boot camp. Uh, both ducks and pheasants, maybe a few quail, a bit of other stuff in there, geese, swans, whatever, but mainly ducks and pheasants, to be honest. Um, on opening morning, I'm starting on a river, on a tidal river, so it'll have upstream current on the incoming tide, a little bit of no current over high tide and low tide, and then it'll have quite a bit of downstream current on outgoing tide, so quite a mixed bag. Um, it's in the mangroves, it's got like firm mud at high tide, it's quite a nice firm entry straight into the water at low tide, I might actually have quite a bit of soft mud um, for the dog to deal with and a bit of a steep bank of soft mud. And I've got, on the one hand, I've got nice open water right there. 
but then I'm also surrounded by mangrove, so I've got a real mix um, to start Miko off with, but she's already been fetching. I, last year, I preempted it. Um, Miko, how old was Miko last year? She was still actually um, about two, but I hadn't done any... I hadn't done any introduction to gunfire training. I hadn't done any hunting training. It just was out of the question. Wasn't using her. And I was flat out with heaps of other stuff. But um, last year I was literally shooting ducks at my mate's place in this little drain. And uh, by sort of lunchtime Saturday there was, we, there was quite a few shooters around us and the ducks were... We'd see them fly out, fly through the farm and land in the drain and we'd go straight to where the duck just landed. And I don't know if some of them, maybe one or two of them were woundies, but I think one or two of them were just smart old ducks that no matter where they flew, there was pressure and they knew those drains and they knew the farm and they would land in the drain and hide in under the long grass and stuff and you'd go over to where the duck was, where you'd saw it land and you'd look over and, you couldn't see a duck and so you'd walk one way and then that's not there and then you walk back and then and then the duck, would, once you walked for far enough away in one direction, the duck would get up and fly away and the other, they're all hiding in underneath the banks and the grass and everything. And I was saying to my mate, man, I'm training Miko because she would have been an absolute weapon there. Um and at that point too, I put a couple of a couple of ducks in the freezer to use for training. Uh, I also kept a few uh, pigeons that we shot at one point last year too, which were perfect. We work, worked up worked up through all the sizes of different dummies, right up to big bird dummies, and then tying duck feathers and wings to the dummies, and then a few retrieves with the pigeon, and then finally um, retrieves with whole dead ducks that I kept from last year. And um, and that that's it's it's the same as the blueprint, you know, the the deer dog blueprint is is uh, good training. It's all about basically getting the dog ready to do everything that it's going to need to do out in the field before you even get there. So when it does get there, it's easy and it does it all well and it it learns quickly and there's no knocks to its confidence and it's just moving forward leaps and bounds, you know, and um. Miko is, again, I've pushed her through it pretty quick and I got to a point actually where I had to back off and there's, there's loads of interesting stuff in the bird dog boot camp and it, it's all completely unscripted. There's a bit of it sitting here going over a few notes and explaining a bit of stuff about what you're about to see or what you just did see. Um, but the vast majority of it is just out in the field filming and explaining and camera on the tripod and I use a GoPro quite a bit um, and I've used a drone as well. Um, but uh, yeah, Miko is now fetching ducks out of the river, whole dead ducks thrown out in the river and she's got swimming out and getting them and bringing them back and um, good with the shotgun and she's just keen to go. I had her out at the out at the spot where I'm shooting next weekend, and um, she's just walking around and looking out in the water and waiting for something to retrieve and just chomping at the bit. So, um, touch wood. I don't want to jinx it by saying it's going to be amazing, but uh, it's it's pretty exciting. All in all, um, I was I was I've always been mad keen on bird hunting, uh, and but growing up as a kid, I like frothed on bird hunting really loved it and anyone that's really passionate about it will know it it's one of those things like like uh if you're into it you're into it and i'm into it and uh it's something i did a lot growing up and it's something that i've had a big break away from and i've always freaking missed it man and and i've always really looked forward to getting back to it uh, and doing it properly, um, so I'm freaking excited, man! It's going to be cool. That's it. We'll leave it there. If you want to find out more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, go to BigGameIndicatingDogs.com. 
If you want to see photos and posts from people that have followed the blueprint, go to Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, if you're listening to the audio of this podcast, you can watch the video versions of them at Big Game Indicating Dogs on YouTube. Uh, there's also some hunting videos there, loads more Q&As and tons of Big Game Indicating Dog stuff. Uh, there's also the Paul John Michaels podcast. If you're watching this on the Big Game Indicating Dogs YouTube channel, or you're watching the video version of this somewhere, anywhere, it's all over the place, you can listen to the audio version of this Q&A and loads of other podcasts and Q&As and tons of stuff on the Paul John Michaels podcast. Available on Spotify, iTunes and all the good podcast apps. Uh, and you can follow my personal stuff, which is actually where I've been posting most of the bird dog stuff and a bunch of other stuff that I do. At Paul John Michaels on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And on YouTube, my Paul John Michaels YouTube, uh, there's some big game indicating dogs, hunting videos there, there's some fishing videos there, and a bit of other stuff. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you there.